Carl Hoppe here, Extension Livestock Specialist here at the Carrington Research Extension Center. I'd like to talk about feeds, alternative feeds, and cost of gain. Part of our backgrounding series that we do every year. Um, we got a lot of different things going on here this year. We got a lot of nice spring-born calves that uh, are being weaned. You know, it's, it's a different scenario that we have out here these days. It used to be we'd always wean calves in October and uh, then place them on feed. But since we're calving out cows later in the year, Rather than March calving, we've gone to April calving. We've switched to later weaning times for calves. And that therein lies while we're doing this webinar a little bit later in the year, just to reflect later times of, uh, of production. So we got spring-born calves. We always like to talk about feeding, or at least I certainly do. But something unique this year compared to other years is that, and Tim's already talked about it, and so has Brian, our feed prices have really dropped a lot compared to last year. Make some opportunities. We had a great, well, some places had a great year for production. And with that, uh, we've got feed resources available, feed cattle. I like to take a trip down memory lane. And that is, I like to look at prices of different feeds as well as um, co-product feeds and things we produce available for our cow herd. In 2017, corn was only 288 a bushel. How quick we forget what the price of corn was and the price of cattle were low at that time too. But alfalfa hay was $80 a ton, grass hay at $65, wheat mids were $95 a ton, barley malt sprouts were $115. That's back when we had barley malt sprouts. Now we don't really have them in North Dakota anymore. Corn slash was priced at $30 a ton. Canola mill is $186 a ton and dried distillers is at $113. Oh, for the days of, of lower prices. And then you go to 2018, prices increased a little bit, but not much. 19 prices didn't change as, as much at that time. Um, so we had three years of prices that really didn't move much. Then let's go to 2020. Prices are still the same. Canola mill increased a little bit though, but the rest of the feeds remained somewhat constant. Dry distillers moved up a little bit as well. But then in 2021, the price of corn really skyrocketed. And of course, following with it, the price of hay, uh, co-products, uh, corn silage, canola meal, distillers grains, they all increased as well at the same time. 2002 shares the same thing. High corn prices, high hay prices, high canola meal prices, everything's high again. And so what's happened in 2003? Most people didn't think we're going to see $4 corn. And correspondingly, the price of the rest of the feeds have gone down as well. So hay usually uh, remains pretty good. That's kind of a localized demand type thing. It costs a lot to transport hay from different locations. So if you have good hay production in one location, you'll end up with uh, um, maybe a lower price in that region. But if you're short on hay, then the price is probably going to go up. Wheat mids, again, are a decent price. Soy hulls, um, we've got production in North Dakota. So consequently, that price is where it is. Corn silage has dropped down. It reflects the corn price corn price per bushel. Um, the thumb rule I tend to use there is for every, uh, for the price of corn per bushel times 10 is the price per ton of corn silage, assuming that's 64, 5, 6% moisture corn silage. Canola meal is, there's demand for it at 348. It's an expensive source of protein. And then there's dried distillage grains, which is uh, ever popular and always priced accordingly for um, uh, feeding cattle. So now we're going to look at another variable weather year. Some places were droughted out. They chopped corn in August. Other places had an excellent crop. And some places uh, just didn't have much at all. It was really variable throughout North Dakota and what your resources were. And so some places had an excellent grass year. Calves weaned off heavy. But we always have that issue that comes on with weather changes. So I'd like to talk a little bit about other feed resources we have in North Dakota, above and beyond those that reduce on farm. When I go to other states and visit about their milling capacity and co-product production, it's amazing how North Dakota really stands out with the amount of production that we actually have. We produce a lot of different types of co-products in North Dakota from our mills, as well as the quantity of them. If you notice on this picture, a lot of these co-products are produced in the Red River Valley or mostly on the eastern part of the state. But if you look at that big yellow dot, that's ethanol. We have distilleries located throughout the southern part of the state. 
Um, we have feed resources, especially in South Dakota, but a lot in North Dakota when it comes to dried distillers grains or modified or wet distillers grains. We actually have several wheat mills in North Dakota. Our state mill and elevator up at Grand Forks is the largest flour mill producing wheat mids in the world in one location. It's huge. And of course, we have uh, mills in Foster County uh, with Dakota growers. And then, of course, down in Richland County with Horizon Mills. And of course, we've got the mill up in Minot as well for wheat middlings, which uh, works as an excellent high fiber, high protein feed for cattle. We don't have a malt production anymore in North Dakota. There is a small one over in Moorhead, Minnesota. We have a lot of sugar beet pulp available in North Dakota. Um, we got multiple plants up and down the Red River Valley. Nothing out west anymore. That's uh, not, a, not the case, but we do. Um, and unfortunately, this product is usually high in moisture. So to haul it from one location to the other, uh, gets it expensive to get to the western part of the state. But for those located near a plant, that's a really reasonable price feed stuff. Um, we actually have potato waste in a couple of different locations in the state, Grand Forks and Jamestown. Of course, if you're a consumer year round, that's something that you might consider because they produce potato waste throughout the whole year. Another thing that we have in North Dakota would be the oil crushes. So we have uh, canola mills um, in uh, crushes that crush the canola mill in Velva, as well as Ransom, excuse me, Uterland, as well as West Fargo. Um, that's canola mill. We have some swing plants like Endolin that also produce sunflower meal, and soybean meal at certain times. Uh, same with the plant in Cass County. We have a new plant being developed. Or it's online now in Stutzman County. Uh, green bison uh, soybean processing. And of course, that's producing soybean meal and soy hulls. Uh, we do have a fructose high uh, plant uh, that produces uh, sugar out of uh corn, wet corn milling plant, and they produce um, uh, corn gluten meal. Unfortunately, most of that's not available in North Dakota. It goes to the dairy facilities in Minnesota. But we produce a lot of co-product feeds in North Dakota, so there's always a resource available for feeding. As I pointed out earlier, we have a lot of different distillers grains. There's five plants in North Dakota producing wet, modified, and dried distillers grains, as well as condensed cellular solubles. Uh, some of those make those a lot of time is put it back onto the distillers grains, making distillers grains with solubles. We have five plants that produce wheat middlings. Some of those are pelleted. We produce pelleted soybean mills in two plants in North Dakota now. There'll be a third one someday in Castleton as well. Uh, wet corn or corn gluten feed one plant. Pay to buy products to beet tailings are extremely wet, but they're available. Beet pulp is wet also. We actually have dry beet pulp that comes at a higher price. A lot of those other tailings and pulp are reduced price, sometimes just for the price of hauling. We have lots of different meals available in North Dakota. And then, of course, we have the ever-present uh, screenings that, it, that are available through our different uh, cleaners and elevators in North Dakota. I'm going to switch now and talk a little bit about daily nutrient feed cost. We've got some, some assumptions here. We're going to use a 700-pound steer calf. They normally eat around 3% of body weight. That's a good thermal rule to use, 3% of body weight. That's on an as-fed basis with 90% dry moisture, okay? If you do on a dry matter intake basis, it'd actually be about 18 pounds of dry matter they produce a day. Um, they need, for some decent gain, they need like 14 pounds of TDN or a mega cal, 57 mega cal ration, and they need 13% crude protein ration as well. So my point here in this slide is to look at the cost of energy. So if we need 14.2 pounds of TDN, the cost per pound of TDN based on the corn price would be a nine, nine, basically nine cents per pound, which means a total daily feed cost of $1.30 uh, for energy. Now, that'll also need protein and they need 2.33 pounds of protein in their daily ration. And if you're just to go out and price protein off of uh, distillers grains, it would be 0 0.338 per pound, or we'd spend 90 cents a day for the protein cost. So people like to talk about protein, but there's a fallacy here. When you buy energy, when you buy corn, 9% of that corn is protein. So you actually get the corn, that part of the protein in the ration for free because you paid it to, you bought it for the energy content and the protein came along with it. 
So all we really need to do is add the pay for the supplemental protein. And so the animal needs 2.33 pounds. Uh, what's provided in a corn that's provide the energy would move to 1.74 pounds of protein, meaning you need to supplement six tenths or 0.59 pounds of protein per day. At 388 cents a pound, that would be 22 to 23 cents per pound per day, excuse me, pound, dollars per day for protein. So my point here is that energy costs would drive feeding cattle. Protein is an added that's needed to the value out of the energy that we provide to the animal, but the energy cost is the big driver in getting gain in cattle. I like to put in a plug for water. You tend to think that rural water and those types of things are really expensive, but when you look at the actual cost, uh, it's really pennies per day versus that dollar fifty in this example, just for the energy and protein we'd have to have to feed the cattle. So water is very important in our rations. Um, it's usually not considered that much. We just assume it's available, but you definitely need to have adequate volume and quality available for cattle to have good gains. I like to talk about feed value, cost per pound of nutrient. And that's the thing I look at is uh, um, look at cost per pound of the, excuse me, cost per ton of the feed. So we got canola meal. Buy it today, it would be $348 a ton. Earlier, I said we need to price it on a per pound basis, so it's 17 cents per pound is the cost of canola meal. Now, if we're going to buy it for crude protein value, it costs us 44 cents or 45 cents. If we're looking at the TDN cost of what it contains, it contains 62% TDN, so it would have 28 cents as a cost per pound of protein, of, of, of energy, I'm sorry. Look, weight meds, we can do the same math, $160 a ton. So the cost per pound of protein is $0.46. Cents. Cost per pound of TDN is $0.10. Cents. Look at corn grain now. It's $148 a ton. Um, that'd be $0.07 cents a pound. And if we go to cost per pound today, it'd be $0.87 cents for cost of crude protein. And, of course, our cost per pound of energy is only $0.09, cents, $0.9.6. Cents. DDGs are at $0.12.2 cents for energy. Protein is 0.39. So if we look at this graph and quick uh, table and quickly look at what's our cheapest cost of protein? Huh, distillers grains. What's our cheapest cost of energy? It would be corn. And we could actually use wheat mids. When we look at the combination, we do a ration, all of a sudden corn grain and distillers ends up being one of our most competitive combinations to add for backgrounding cattle. Well, there are some feed issues I'd like to talk about for backgrounding cattle in fall of 2003 and winter of 2004. Um, because of the variability across the state, um, be sure to test your haze for nitrates. If it's over 1,500 parts per million nitrate, you need to dilute it with other feeds. Of course, since we're doing uh, um, backgrounding, growing calves, part of that ration is going to be grain. So it's pretty easy to dilute this um, because grains are normally very low in nitrates. Always encourage you to sample your feed, especially the haze and corn sizes, to know what type of energy content and protein content that's needed, uh, that's, that's in the feed and what's available for the animal that's needed for the requirements. Weeds and ergot is always a consideration. Uh, some rye was put up this year that might have ergot in it. Wheat can do the same thing. Um, too high level can definitely reduce uh, blood flow to the extremities. You can have some ear loss and tail loss and that type of thing. Always to be weary when you buy screenings that whatever things come with it might have a problem with your animal. So be sure to limit those. Things like corn screenings, uh, for the most part, they're pretty pure. They're just corn, cracked corn. There might be some uh, um, cockleburs in there, but for the most part, it's just straight corn. If we start looking at some of the other feeds, barley, wheat, whatever, then you might have some other things in there. This year, our corn was actually premature. Uh, we had good test weight, so we don't have to look at light test weight feeds. Our corn silage, depending upon location, might have been immature, but a lot of them put up uh, uh, it at, at the right moisture content. Just the immature corn silage usually has a higher percent water, so there might have been some seepage out of the corn silage pile, which from a feeding standpoint, means you had higher nutrient loss in that feed and you have less feed available um, because part of that nutrient was leached out of the pile. Again, a good reason to do feed analysis on the feed. Haze oily is variable, and I've seen a lot of variability this year between 
from fields as well as the cuttings between fields. Uh, early on, we had some rain. In the middle of summer, we didn't. So consequently, your alfalfas might have different values of TDN or relative feed value just because of the rain and when the cutting was actually done. Sure to test feeds, that's the issue here. We do have some lower feed prices, and everybody's hit on that this year, but the calves are high priced, so we have to do our budgets like Brian suggested. I do like to point out that, according to my math, compared to last year, our corn price was 35% lower. We've got lots of corn available. Freight costs really haven't changed, so that's kind of the same. And uh, I guess we have lots of it around. And so when it comes to hay prices, that usually follows the corn price somewhat. It's expensive hay like it's all around, like I said earlier, but at least uh, there is feed grains for backgrounding cattle this year, as well as feeding a coward. Now I'd like to talk a little bit about rations and different gains for seven weight steers. Now this would be an average six to eight weights. The average would be seven weights. So this is an example I use. And I like to point out that as we increase the gain in cattle, we usually get better feed efficiency and our cost of gain usually goes down. Not total cost per day, but cost per pound of gain. And cost gain is what we sell, so I always look at the cost per pound gain. Our first example is just a really simple grass hay and wheat mids. I'll give you about two pounds a day gain. Great for just kind of background of those peppers that we're going to breed. And this is steers, but um, uh, looking at this at two pounds a day, our feed to gain is 10 to 1 because there's a lot of fiber here. Um, the TDN of the ration is 64 or 38 megacal ration. Feed cost is 59 cents. If we just tweak this ration a little bit, increase the alfalfa hay by four pounds, increase the wheat mids by three pounds, we'll get an increase in average daily gain of six tenths of a pound, 2.6 pounds per day gain. Our TDN value in this feed is 69%. Feed to gain is 7.7. We look at the NEG, that's a 45 NEG ration. And our feed cost went from 59 cents per pound to gain to 52 cents. Well, let's play with it a little bit more and increase the wheat mids to 12 pounds. We don't need the alfalfa hay now because we're getting plenty of protein from the wheat mids in this ration. Our grass hay is fairly decent, like a 54 TDN, 56 TDN hay. Uh, in this example, we have to add limestone because our calcium phosphorus ratios are certainly out of whack when we feed that much wheat mids. So limestone is imperative to be added. Our gain is now 2.8 pounds per day. Our feed to gain is five to is 7.2 to one. Our megacals in this ration is 47. And our feed cost of gain went up to 66 cents. Hmm. Yeah. So what happened here? A little bit of our haze were priced competitively. The wheat mids made a nice supplement. But when we increased the wheat mids, the cost of our feeds went out of went 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 awry because wheat mids are still higher than the haze. And our cost per uh, um, feed cost um, actually went, actually it should have gone down. That's a math error on this particular slide. I apologize for that. The cost is $1.32 a day. So we divide that by three. It's going to be even lower at around 40 some cents. I'll have to change that. Excuse me. Now we're moving on to another ration with uh, alfalfa hay and corn silage. We're going to get 1.8 pounds per day gain. We'd feed eight pounds of alfalfa hay, which provides protein. The corn silage provides the energy at 29 pounds. It seems like a lot of corn silage, but realize it's two-thirds water. So uh, feed to gain, that's on an as-fed basis. The NEG of the ration is 38. Our feed cost to gain be almost 70 cents per pound of gain. Now we can change this to another ration of grass, hay, alfalfa, hay, corn grain, and wheat mids. Of course, the grain, uh, corn grain is for the energy. Wheat mids is for the protein plus energy. And of course, alfalfa has got a little protein in it as well. Our gain is 2.6 and our feed cost per day or pound a gain is 52 cents. Let's raise that up to three pounds a day gain. It doesn't take much to change. We just decrease the grass hay two pounds, increase the corn by four pounds, and we decrease the wheat mids by two pounds. Just change the ratio around. Now, rather than 2.6 pounds per day gain, we went up to three and our feed to gain improved. Our energy of the ration is 50 and our feed cost per gain is 47 cents. Now let's go to another example. We got alfalfa, hay, and corn grain. That's just strictly a dry ration we're going to feed. 2.3 pounds per day gain. Our feed cost is 67 cents per pound of gain. 47 megacal ration. If we do another example here where we got to use a lot more corn grain, alfalfa, hay, but we're going to be short in protein. 
in this ration are actually going to be short in calcium and some other things. And so we need to include a partial supplement of at one and a half pounds per per day in this example. And we'd now get 3.2 pounds per day gain. And look at our feed costs went down to 59 cents. If we, in, if we pick up our average daily gain a little bit more, uh, Feeding even more corn grain, we'll have three and a half pounds per day gain, and our feed costs per pound to gain go down even more. Now we're doing a 56 NEG. Of course, the finishing ration would be the 63 NEG, so this is not a finishing ration. It's a ration on these calves that will make them grow fairly well. I'm going to switch over and use distiller's grains and some rations. We've got 15 pounds of grass hay, but we need them to gain a little bit just because the grass hay doesn't have enough energy to do 1.7 or 1.8 pounds per day gain, we have to include five pounds of dried distillers grains because of the grass hay. And now our feed costs are 75 cents per pound of gain. Not cheap, but one way to um, get calves to gain with that type of a ration. If you wanna increase the gain, we have to increase the grain. So increase the corn by four pounds, increase the distillers by one pound, off the hay five pounds and now we have 2.8 pounds per day gain and our feed costs are 51 cents you can actually pick up the corn even more and adds and decrease the hay have to add some limestone to balance the ration and now we're at 3.4 pounds per day gain and if you look at the feed cost again are at 52 cents but we have more weight to sell in a shorter period of time so as brian mentioned our yardage cost would be less for this particular example lots of different rations to feed cattle it's just a matter of which uh, combination you need to use. And I always like to point out just adding a little bit more of our energy or protein supplements pick up our average daily gain considerably. So if you're down around that 1.7 or two pounds per day gain, you could pick it up and really reduce your cost and increase the amount of calf, amount of pounds you have to sell just by tweaking the ration or changing the ration a little bit. I always like to point this out. Um, if we're going to grow cattle for the grass market, we probably want to look at low rates of gain, less than two pounds per day. If we're looking at, uh, that's mostly because when cattle go out in grass, they usually gain an average of around two pounds per day. So you don't want fat cattle, calves that are basically flesh going out to pasture and losing weight. Um, you want to keep them somewhat green and put them out to pasture green so they grow without losing. Um, if you're not going to go for the grass market, but you want to and grow the cattle without adding too much fat condition. Let's uh, grow them between two and three pounds per day gain. And that's the goal. I'd call that a medium rate of gain. Want to do higher than that? You might have calves put on a little too much fat, which may reduce subsequent feedlot performance. However, and I've got it written there too, um, some of our calves are genetically, genetically disposed to disposed to gain weight without a loss of performance in the feed yard. They can grow and grade extremely well. So if you know the history of your cattle, you know how you can treat them. And uh, if you've been doing, uh, uh, if the buyers know what type of calves you have, and you've been doing this management just about right, you can tell um, where they end up to. You know, overfleshed cattle usually get a discount, but there's a, a happy medium there where you put the weight on without getting them too fleshy. And here's some examples of where you can focus on. Myself personally, always like that 0.75, 2.8, 0.9 pounds per day gain on calves up to 800 to 900 pounds. They're good growthy springborn calves. We can always target a calf gain with a balanced ration. Um, we can do a three pounds a day gain, or we can do a one and a half pound a day gain. In other words, if we want them to be seven, eight, nine hundred pounds at a certain time, we can blend the ration to make that goal. And it's just a matter of uh, uh, making a ration to work. I like to point out uh, feeding for a target weight at a specific day is is the flexibility of backgrounding. You can have three pounds a day gain for sixty days, or a pound and a half for one hundred and twenty days. That's the weight you have. It all depends upon what feed you have available and the price you put at those feeds. The concept that I had to learn late in life, well, it was actually a long time ago, but um, in our sheep market, we feed lambs as quick as possible because they need to be dead within a year of age. Okay, otherwise they turn into mutton. With cattle, we can delay that up to two years of age, so or longer even. So if we do a slower rate of gain, we actually put these cattle to a different market time and a different price structure. 
So always consider that when you're looking at your costs. But one foundation thing that always remains is that as you increase the gain you in, and you increase the grain, you decrease your cost of gain. Uh, we do have co-products available in North Dakota. I do have an info sheet that I can share with uh, different uh, locations and phone numbers and uh, prices for that particular time. Um, it'll be available on our website as well. Uh, one comment about co-products, sometimes you can price those, contract price them in the summertime. Because usually our traditional summer prices are low. Location and freight prices always affect compet competitiveness. Uh, Western North Dakota definitely has more freight, so all of a sudden some of the local feeds there might be cheaper than hauling in co-products from someplace else. But one thing that backgrounding cattle do use quite well are high-fiber rations and then protein sources and co-products usually fit both of those at the same time if you're looking for feed. Uh, please consider when you're looking at rations to provide great results. You need good feed bunk management. Uh, you need to look at the feed bunks. You know, I used to say you need to teach cattle how to eat. Well, you need to train them to eat at a particular time every day and not just have them go into eating some a little bit today and a little bit more tomorrow and not less the next day after that. They get on a roller coaster of intake and that does not provide good feed efficiency. So they need to, you know, when you're starting out backgrounding calves, um, you definitely want to keep feed uh, for them, but you, on the same time, need to keep them wanting to eat feed. Of course, when they come up, uh, you can tell who's sick at the same time. That'll be talked about later. Bedding always helps in calves because you're producing a calf that somebody else is going to buy. They certainly like clean calves. Uh, not only that, in our cold winters in North Dakota, bedding will actually improve our rates again, provide better creature comfort. And so bedding is something that is an expense, but it can pay off, especially if you're not a large feed yard, a smaller backgrounder, uh, somebody who's feeding the cowherd certainly works. Be sure to clean your water. Calves can't withstand much moldy feed, so try to keep that away. That'll cause a digestive upset. Maybe you can feed that moldy silage to the cows, but try to steer away from any of that stuff for your calves. That'll affect them. Um, keep them healthy through feeding. Uh, and that's, again, by training them to eat out of the feed bunks at, at the same time every day. They're creatures of habit. They like to eat at the same time. We like to eat at the same time ourselves. They do, too. We like to clean, eat off of a clean plate. They like to eat off of a clean feed bunk as well, so keep that in consideration. We like to adapt our rations, use a step-up ration, uh, different NEGs for different time frames. You might step up the NEGs over a month period. Uh, like I said earlier, balance the ration for your rate gain goals that you'd like to have. Um, other things you can do to improve feed per gain would be to use ionophores. They certainly, like Robenson and Robotech, uh, they certainly improve feed efficiency. Implants will do the same thing, and that'll be talked about a little bit later. Uh, be sure to control coccidiosis. Robenson and Robotech help with that, but things like dequinate and amprolium can certainly control those. And if you do have stresses that lead to coccidiosis outbreaks, by all means, feed additives before it breaks are something that work quite well. Again, training cattle to eat, eat and eat early is very important in helping those later on. So I'd just like to summarize this year, our feed prices are lower than they were in previous couple of years. Our highly average daily gains always have a lower cost per pound to gain. I hope you've seen the scenarios there that show that. Uh, lots of ration options. It all depends upon what feed sources you have available. Uh, we can make about anything work, and the prices fit in there, too. If you need some extra feed, co-products are usually high in protein. They're high in fiber, too, so that really makes a great backgrounding ration. Um, you just need to balance it. And with good management, leads good calf gains. So don't give up on working these calves uh, onto a good ration. Mm -hmm.